$428 billion. I want you to remember that number as I share with you my comments today. Um, and we'll come back to that in a short bit. Um, but that's the number I want you to remember uh, when I walk away today. I want to share with you about the issue of adverse childhood experiences uh, through the lens of someone who has worked in this field for many, many years. And I'm not here to talk necessarily about the direct impacts that we see right after this happens. I'm here to talk with you more about uh, some amazing research that's been done that looks at the long-term implication, the long-term cost of children being exposed to adverse childhood experiences. Now, this research was collected back in the 1990s, uh, and a insurance company out of the California area had this unique idea to say, listen, we wonder if things that happen in childhood have a connection to how our patients, our, our clients are doing as they get older. If children had negative experiences in childhood, like sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, uh, a parent who had a substance abuse problem, a parent who was incarcerated, uh, domestic violence in the home, if they had some of these experiences, does that impact their health as they get older? Uh, does it impact the health issues that they're facing uh, throughout their lifetime? And if so, uh, how does that connection necessarily work? And so they implemented for all of their patients, they asked them about 10 questions about ad different adverse childhood experiences. And individuals could have a score ranging from zero to a, a, a score of 10 if they had had all of these experiences. And the researchers said then, well, what, what do we find? What have we connected as far as these things happening in childhood and the impacts on, our, on, on health status of individuals? And there's been more than 50 studies published over the years, uh, and every study has found a, a, an impact, a link. Uh, the more adverse childhood experiences there are, the worse the health outcomes. And it crosses the board across all kinds of things. Uh, for example, an individual who has four adverse childhood experiences is 390 times more likely to develop COPD than someone who had none of these experiences. More than 460% likely to have depression. Uh, for an individual who has uh, four of those adverse childhood experiences, their likelihood of committing suicide is 1,220% higher. And it crosses the realm of all kinds of experiences. In fact, individuals who had a history of six of these adverse childhood experiences, they on average live less, uh, 20 years less than their peers who had a score of zero. So there is an amazing connection between the health status of individuals when they've experienced childhood abuse or other adverse childhood experiences and their long-term health outcomes. But it's not just necessarily that they have these health outcomes. What happens when we have health outcomes, health issues that we're facing? It then becomes a financial issue. Uh, and it caught the cost of health care increases the more kinds of issues that we're facing. So another study has found that individuals who have a history of sexual abuse, their health their, uh, healthcare costs are 16% higher than an individual who did not experience child sexual abuse. And for an individual who experienced both child sexual abuse and child physical abuse, their health care costs are 36% higher. We're talking not just about the real life challenging and painful issue of child maltreatment. This, we're actually putting this into terms that translate this to a financial issue and why this is something we should care about. Now we also know from the research that 9% of all child uh, Medicaid expenses are related to child abuse. And Medicaid is a huge issue that faces our nation, every state in our nation. How do we fund Medicaid? Well, responding to child abuse could potentially eliminate 9% of all those Medicaid costs. So we talk about health care, but it's not just health care and the cost of health care and the health care impacts that I want to share with you. I also want to let you know that individuals who do have these higher health care challenges, they are fundamentally challenged to address those because on average, individuals who've experienced abuse earn $8,000 less per year. They're less likely to own a house. They're less likely to own a car. They're less likely to have stocks or any kind of retirement. They're less likely to have a savings account. So individuals who've experienced childhood maltreatment have higher health care issues, 
higher health care costs, and reduce resources to help address them. It's a huge issue. It's a huge issue that we as a nation must address. Uh, sorry. Um, so I've defined the problem for you. What I want to share with you is a part about the solution. And start here in Huntsville, Alabama, in 1985, the National Children's Advocacy Center was created. It was the first ever center of its kind in the world. The center where you, we would bring together the various professionals from law enforcement, child protection services, uh, mental health providers, medical providers, prosecutors, victim advocates, all to work in a coordinated fashion to address the issue of child abuse. And this center that started in Huntsville was seen as a, it was a social entrepreneurship. It was an innovative idea to try something new that hadn't been done before. And what happened is it was a miraculous success, uh, a, a beacon of hope for many individuals who may have experienced abuse. And in this community, we, we saw the program grow from this fledgling idea to a full functioning program where children receive all the services they need when there have been allegations of child sexual abuse, severe physical abuse, exposure to violence. And we see that children are actually healing from this experience and most likely are not gonna have those higher health care costs, those higher health care impacts, those the reduced income earning potential over time. That children actually fundamentally can recover from this experience while making our community safer. And this idea spread, it spread amazingly quickly around the United States where now there are more than 950 children's advocacy centers throughout the United States that last year served over 365,000 children. Imagine that, 1,000 new children every single day of the year receiving quality, evidence-based services to help them heal while holding those who harm them accountable. And this model has grown, too. It has expanded throughout the world. We're in 36 countries around the world. We have seen the development of these similar type programs, all started out of Huntsville, Alabama. And... And these programs have been found to be amazingly successful. Every single research study that's ever been published has found a positive impact, whether it's children being less afraid, more likely to get medical services, parents feeling that the investigation uh, process was handled in a professional manner, increased prosecution rates, better mental health outcomes, better case prosecution outcomes. Across the board, every single study has found a positive impact. And one of the most amazing is, is that it's not just on that side of the equation of service outcomes. We actually have found that having this coordinated, multidisciplinary approach is also saving us a thousand dollars per case. We are eliminating duplication of service, streamlining the system to make it more trauma-informed, more, more accessible and serviceable for the, those who need it, while not requiring them to go through unnecessary hoops and hurdles to try to accomplish safety for their children and families. And all these services provided at no charge. So better outcomes usually cost us more money. In this situation, better outcomes are actually saving us money. And that doesn't even get to the other point. The, pri uh, uh, the point of my talk today was I shared a number with you. It was 428 billion. 428 billion is a large number. It is the estimated annual cost in our country associated with child maltreatment. So if we can address the issue of child maltreatment, we can have a dramatic impact on our nation's health, well-being, economy, uh, and that's why it's so important. But I wanna share with you a more personal side of this uh, work. And I want to t share a story with you about the power of this solution to the problem I've described. The solution is the Child Advocacy Center model to address child abuse. And in this particular case, I want to share with you, there was an 11-year-old girl who revealed at school that her uncle, her mother's brother, had done something to her. And I'm not going to get graphic with the details. But I do want to share with you that she was brought to the Children's Advocacy Center for what's called a forensic interview, which is the starting point. And a trained interviewer interviews the child to find out from their perspective what, did, what happened. 
And during this interview, the young girl, the 11 year old described uh, things that her uncle had done uh, in some de degree of detail. Following her interview, she was, um, the, she was gonna just be able to hang out and relax and the investigators were gonna meet with her parent, her mother, to talk about what happened in the interview, what are the next steps gonna be, and to help prepare her for the, you know, as this moves forward. And this 11 year old had a, a moment of clarity and asked if, if, hey, can I draw on the sidewalk? Is it okay if I draw on the sidewalk? And they said, sure, that's fine. We have some chalk here. You can go draw on the sidewalk. Uh, and they, they did say that, you know, other kids will be coming here. So make sure that whatever you write on the sidewalk is going to be okay for other kids to see. Uh, so the investigators speak with the mother. They talk about what happened in the interview. They talk about how the case is going to be moving forward. Uh, and the investigation will, you know, continue and how they can be in touch. Uh, and they finish that up and they come outside uh, from there and they come to find these steps here. And what they find on these steps is what this young girl has written about her experience. And on the bottom step, if you can't see it very well, I'll share with you. She, it says, when you step here, you have faith. And on the second step, she wrote, when you step here, you have hope. And the third step, when you step here, you are not afraid. And the fourth step, when you step here, you are loved. And then the last step, when you step here, you are ready. This girl wanted to communicate to others that where they were, where they were going was a safe place and a place that was going to help them. And this is the power of the Children's Advocacy Center model and what we do. I described a problem to you. We have this huge impact on our nation's health care system, health impacts, and also our economic viability as a nation impacted by child maltreatment. But the good news, good news is, is that over the last 20 years, we've seen a nearly 50% decline in child sexual abuse in the United States, a nearly 50% decline in physical abuse in the United States. We are making progress because of programs like the Children's Advocacy Center model, prevention programs that we offer all throughout the country. So it, all hope is not lost. This is a serious problem affecting us, but we also have a very strong and powerful solution to help address it. And I thank you for your attention to my talk today.